I'm going to try to break down a really complex subject, the development of T cells. Now with that, the caveat is I'll be going basically from the hematopoietic stem cell up to the naive uh, T cell. We won't be looking at how uh, T, uh, naive T cells turn into Th1, Th2, or Th17. The question for hematopoietic stem cell is do I want to become lymphoid uh, or myeloid? And then once it becomes lymphoid progenitor, does it want to become a T or a B? So to B or not to B? A reductionist viewpoint would be hematopoietic stem cell, lymphoid progenitor, or then to B, T, or natural killer cell. And the way this is controlled is that all of the cells, all of the, the genes and the material that need to go from here, from, from the progenitor cell, to here or here or here, all of these uh, special genes are locked up inside of the DNA within hits, histones and chromatin. And in order to go to, let's say, a B cell, you would need to unlock the chromatin, unlock the DNA that's locked inside of there in order to express those genes. And the same thing for T cells, the same thing for natural killer cells. They all have their own special genes and it's locked up inside of the, uh, the chromatin. Specifically, to become an alpha beta T cell, you have to have signaling from notch 1 and GATA 3. So that brings up the question, what exactly is notch? So let's take a look here. If we have our cell membrane, we have the surface protein. This is a notch. Down here, we have our nucleus. Now, under certain conditions, notch will be cut and this cleavage product will move down into the nucleus and become a transcription factor. GATA3 is an intracellular signal, so that we have the GATA3 locus. Whenever it's transcribed, it goes out and it comes back in and activates as another transcription factor for other genes. What this specific image is showing, this is uh, taken from uh, Nature and um, was part of an article, How TH2 Type Immune Responses Initiated and Amplified. So essentially it's saying that GATA3 and STAT5 are necessary to move into a TH2 type of cell. I know what you're thinking. So what? In fact, that's what I was thinking whenever I was reading all this. But it's important for a couple reasons. First of all, T and B cells have their own uh, lineages and their own signals to move into those specific lineages. And if the signals are messed up in either one of those things, then you could be deficient in that specific type of cell. So you could become deficient in T cells if the signals and the, the proteins and, and the transcription factors are not working properly. Now before we go on to the rest of T cell development, I want to take a quick look at exactly what a T cell receptor is. So basically this guy right here is the T cell receptor. He's made up of an alpha chain and a beta chain. You see all of these other molecules around it are necessary for it to work. In this case I'm showing a CD4 positive T cell. Now, the T cell could, could very well have been a CD8 positive T cell. In fact, they'll use CD8 will both use an alpha and a beta chain as well. Understanding this T cell receptor is vital to understanding T cell development. So a couple things I want to point out. This CD4, this is a co-receptor for the TCR. And what it will do is it will help to bind it to an MHC class 2 uh, molecule. And if we had, let's say, a CD8, we'll just call this a CD8. If this was a CD8, then this would help bind it to an MHC class 1 protein. But most importantly, remember that there's an alpha chain and a beta chain. You also notice that there's a, uh, there's these zeta proteins that are associated with it as well that uh, usually aren't mentioned in, in uh, the circles that I run in. So in the bone marrow we have these progenitor T cells. They've been produced, they've been released, 
And in the bone marrow and also in the thymus, you get the production of interleukin-7. Interleukin-7 causes proliferation. This is mainly going to take place in the thymus. Uh, however, so how does the T-cell get to the thymus? How does it know where to go? So here's my T-cell. And on its surface, it has something called CCR9. Okay, that looked horrible, so I had to redraw it. Unfortunately, this doesn't look much better. Now I'm going to attempt to draw a thymus. So there's my thymus. And my thymus is producing something called CCL25. CCR9 is like a homing missile for CCL25. So th it's going to follow this concentration straight back to the thymus. And two steps remain uh, that, uh, well, not two steps. The next two steps, it, the T cell is going to proliferate and it's going to start rearranging its DNA. Let's go ahead and take a look at the DNA rearrangement. So in the middle here, we have the completed T cell receptor. And remember, I said there's an alpha chain and a beta chain. Up here, we're getting a look at how the alpha chain is put together. And down here, we're getting a look at how the beta chain is put together. So each chain is made up of essentially three elements. There's the variable element, the V. Then there's the diversity element, which is the D. You can see down here, the, the diversity element, the diversity region is not on the alpha chain, but it is on the beta chain. And then there's a joining segment noted with a J. So what happens inside of this uh, T cell is that it will randomly select one of its variable regions, it'll randomly select one of its joining regions, and it'll combine it to its constant region. Again, down here, a variable region, a diversity region, a joining region, and a constant region. All of them randomly selected. Why do they have to be randomly selected? I'll get to that in a second. But once the sections are selected, it goes ahead and cuts out the rest of the DNA that it didn't select. So that DNA, even though it's part of your, your body's DNA, it gets cut out of these T cells. They want nothing to do with that, that rest of that DNA. And so the DNA that is inside of your T cells and your B cells is completely different, not completely, but is different than all of the other DNA that's inside of the rest of your body. Now, as these segments are selected and cut out, so the, let's say our V, our v segment, was, this one was selected, it's cut out, and it's joined in here. As these sections are selected and cut out, they randomly get uh, base pairs of DNA deleted and added to them. So not only is this a random section of some V region and some J region, but it's also altered by randomly deleting and adding base pairs as well. So here's what we have. Let's take a look at the TCR, the alpha beta uh, T cell receptor. So we have our alpha chain and we have our beta chain. Now in our alpha chain, the variable segments, there are 45 of them in the alpha chain, 50 in the beta chain. The diversity segments, you have two of them in the beta chain. And in this diversity segment, can it read in three frames? Yes, it often does read in all three frames whenever it's uh, making copies. Then, there's, is there in-region diversification? How many joining segments are there, 55 and 12? Now, remember, I said that each of these regions gets randomly selected. So if I have 45 variable regions, I'm going to randomly select one of those. I'm going to randomly select one of my diversity regions. I'm going to randomly select one of my joining regions. And so I can recombine these. And how many possible combinations can I get? The answer is a lot but it's not enough. In order to have enough T cell receptor diversity to identify any possible pathogen that could enter your body, these receptors have to undergo recombination. That's meaning the DNA bases get deleted and added randomly on these various segments. If you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, we're almost there. Just hang on a second. Because I know it feels like um, we're not in his classroom. I'm trying to make it simple. 
Okay, so we've had our hematopoietic stem cell, we've had the precursors go into the thymus. I've tried to draw kind of what, what a thymus looks like using the various graphics that I don't know how to use. Anyhow, so whenever it first goes into the thymus, it's going to be called a double negative. So you have actually four stages of double negative. And the reason why it's called double negative is because it doesn't express CD4 or CD8. The first thing it does, remember I said IL-7 causes proliferation, so you get proliferation and then you get the genetic recombinations to the, uh, to the T cell receptor. And this recombination is going to happen first to the beta chain and a cell that can successfully produce a beta chain won't die. Cells that can't successfully produce a beta chain, they will die. Oh wow, look at that. Okay, so they will die. Now when this beta chain is produced, it's shipped to the surface of the cell, but it's shipped up with a fake alpha chain. So here's my beta chain, and then it gives me this fake alpha chain. I'm going to put it in red. So this is a fake alpha chain. This is also called the invariant chain or the pre-T alpha. So right here we're going to have our, our TCR, it's got the real beta chain that's been rearranged and everything's been done to it. It's got a fake alpha chain and we're going to see how well this receptor can bind to MHC. And what's going to happen here is that we're going to test them. If they can't recognize MHC, they're going to die. And so you get the expression of both MHC class 1 and class 2. And the reason for that is we don't know whether the T cell receptor we made, we don't know whether it's going to identify a class 1 or a class 2. And so if it hooks up with a class 1, then it will go on to become a CD8 cell. If it identifies a class 2, it will go on to become a CD4 cell. And the way this is signaled to the T cell is by the differential uh, amount of signal. So if it gets a low signal, um, it's probably going to become a CD8 cell, and I don't have time to explain this, but if it gets a high signal, it'll become a CD4 cell. And so essentially, whether or not it, it binds to an MHC1 or an MHC2 will determine what it, what it becomes, which makes perfect sense because CD4 cells have to bind with MHC class 2 and CD8 cells have to bind with MHC class 1. If it can't bind to an MHC cell, it will die. Again, I keep losing my pencil. It will die. But so long as it produces the MHC cells, then it will go on to the next step. It'll start producing, it'll start rearranging the alpha chain and go on to the next step, which is going to be positive selection. However, at this time, if it's, a, if it's going to be a CD8 cell, it will stop producing CD4. It'll take the CD4 off of its surface, and at this point it'll be called CD4 negative CD8 positive. On the other hand, this one would become CD8, uh, CD4 positive CD8 negative. Now here's the real beauty of positive selection. First of all, the thymus only produces self cells, self proteins. So in your thymus you produce proteins that are from yourself. This makes perfect sense. I mean it's my thymus, it's, it's my body, it's my T cells. I'm making self proteins. And so I'm going to start presenting all of my self proteins to my T cells. And if my T cells bind too tightly to my self protein, those T cells die. Now I, I know what else you're thinking. In the thymus, you're only going to be able to produce thymus type proteins. Like thymuses don't really produce myocytes. Thymuses really don't produce osteoclasts or any of these other things. So how are we going to present all of these many proteins to the T cells to make sure that they don't react to some other part of the body? And the answer to that is something called air. And basically what air is, it's the autoimmune regulator, autoimmune RE regulator, 
And what this does is it just goes into the nucleus because the nucleus inside of the thymic cells have the genes for that every other cell in your body has. And so through this autoimmune regulator pathway, they can start expressing proteins that are found in other parts of your body and just cutting those proteins up and presenting them on MHC. All of this movement around the thymus, it's, it's regulated by chemokines. And so at, at each stage of the T-cell development, it starts producing different receptors. And those different receptors tell it where in the thymus to go. And the various areas of the thymus are, are secreting different kinds of chemokines. Whenever the T-cell is done going through both positive and negative selection, it is a fully mature, naive T-cell. And because I'm a bad artist, I wanted to give you a better picture. So I found this picture on Wikimedia Commons, free to use. So I'm not breaking any copyright laws like always. So we have our thymus, and then we're going to cut into the thymus. And we can see that we've got some trabeculae that go down in here. If we zoom in right here, we can come down here and we can see basically we, what we had was you've got a suprascapular zone, which is right here. Then you have the cortex and then you've got the corticomedullary junction and then the medulla and that concludes everything what questions do you have for me